Income tax 2023-2024. Residential, rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of dwelling. Focusing in on the rental expenses side of things. This being part two of the rental expenses. Get ready and some coffee because we'll need to handle a little perspiration if we want to do income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication 527 residential rental property including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023 which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. When looking at the individual income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, it's basically a funny income statement. Income minus the equivalent of expenses being deductions equals not net income, but rather taxable income. The Schedule E, like the Schedule C for a sole proprietor business, is basically an income statement in and of itself, having rental income minus rental expenses, which you could call rental deductions, resulting in, in essence, net rental income, which is what rolls into line one income of the income tax formula. This formula outlining, in essence, the Form 1040 calculation, this being the first page of the Form 1040 in the income section, the Schedule E ultimately rolling into Line 8, additional income from Schedule 1, Line 10. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, Part Number 1, additional income, the Schedule E rolling into Line 5, rental real estate from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E. It's called the Supplemental Income and Loss from Rental Real Estate and so on and so forth. Basically an income statement format breaking out the income and expenses by the property. In prior presentations, we gave a general overview of the Schedule E, noting once again the Schedule E basically being an income statement format. So we took a look at the top part of an income statement, rental income, and now we're focusing in on the more difficult part because there's more categories of the expenses side of things, focusing here mainly on a rental property that is a separate entity in that we don't have personal use commingled within it, such as, for example, if we had a rental home that we live in and rent part of it, or if we're talking about a vacation home, which adds the complexity of having a personal and business or rental component to it. So we'll start off keeping the rental property itself. It's a separate rental property, which we can allocate uh, the rental income and expenses to themselves. And then we'll get into the allocation issues uh, when we have the personal and business use. So we're continuing on now. Vacant rental property. So let's imagine we have this second house, this second property we want to use for rental property, but no one's in it. No one is renting it. It is vacant. Does that mean that we have to recategorize it from rental property to something else like a second home or possibly an investment? Remembering that rental property is a little bit different than a Schedule C type business oftentimes, even though they both have that income statement format to them. Because with a Schedule C business, we're usually talking about a type of service business oftentimes. And in first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's OK, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now. I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. A service business like GigWork, for example, we're only gonna have a business if we are providing services that are helping us to generate the revenue. We have to do the work in the gig work to be generating the revenue and then incurring expenses to help us to generate that revenue. When we think about the rental property, we have that kind of passive component to it in that the property itself 
might be earning us income or we might think of it as a passive investment just in terms of hopefully the value of the property going up possibly just because of the location of it rather than any investments that we're putting in it and then we have the active component to it us actually rental, renting and maintaining the property which might have an active component similar to say a schedule c uh, type of situation now if we had that second property and we just thought of it as basically a second home then we might of course treat it differently for taxes possibly still being able to write off the interest on the schedule a as an itemized deduction but not being able to write off all the other kind of rental expenses that might be associated with it if it was a rental property similarly if it was just another investment uh, situation where we're hoping that it goes up in value as a capital investment but we're not renting it then you might have some deductibility of of uh, the investment expenses but possibly not being able to deduct what you would like to or as many things as if it was categorized as the uh, rental property so obviously what we would like to be able to say is that it's still rental property possibly we are actively looking for people to be renting it even though no one is actively within it incurring expenses uh, to show that and possibly that would be something that you would need to demonstrate if the IRS said hey is this actually a rental property or is it a second home or type of investment so if you hold property for the rental purposes you may be able to deduct your ordinary and necessary expenses including depreciation depreciation of course being a big one because if it was your second home for example you might be able to deduct for example the the interest on the loan but some of the other expenses possibly not one of those big ones being of course the depreciation uh, expense so for managing conserving or maintaining the property while the property is vacant however you can't deduct any loss of rental income for the period the property is vacant so remember whenever we go into the loss uh, category the IRS is going to be skeptical because the losses are something you might be able to take against other incomes such as the uh, w-2 income so we might be limited in that case so vacant while listed for sale so if you sell property you held for rental purposes you can deduct the ordinary and necessary expenses for managing conserving or maintaining the property until it is sold so if the property isn't held out and available for rent while leased this uh, for sale the expenses aren't deductible rental expenses so obviously if the property is intended the intent of the property is for rent which you would need to basically demonstrate in the event of an audit by by showing that you're basically holding it out uh, for rental property then you would think that you would be able to deduct the amounts that you had expended in order to maintain the property uh in in the intent of renting it but obviously if you didn't have any intent of renting it you basically were just hoping to flip it have the house have it go up in value and then sell it then you might not be able to deduct the the maintenance and and whatnot rather uh having to include it in the you know the cost of the of the property and possibly dealing with it uh, on a basis situation for the sale area so points so the term points is often used to describe some of the charges paid or treated as paid by a borrower to take out a loan or a mortgage so when we get into the points situation points get a little bit confusing because usually they they are a categorization of the interest or they might be a, a component of the interest and interest on a loan is uh, typically deductible however if we prepaid the interest then you might be in a situation where the IRS is going to want us to basically capitalize uh, the interest so these charges are also called loan organization fees maximum loan charges or premium charges so any of these charges points that are solely for the use of money are interest so because points are prepaid interest you generally can't deduct the full amount in the year paid but must deduct the interest over the term of the loan so points are usually going to be an issue oftentimes when you first purchase a home or for example and then you have to be breaking out the points and properly categorize the points once they're properly categorized then it should be fairly easy going forward 
So in other words, are the points interest or are they not interest? If they're not interest, are they something deductible or more likely possibly something that should be in the cost of the home and put on the books as part of the asset that will then be deducted in the form of depreciation? If they are interest, they're probably going to be prepaid interest. So and, and remember that the, the IRS is going to say you're on a cash based system, but we're, we don't like prepayments of things because we think that's going to allow you to distort what your taxes will be. So therefore, usually you would have to put those points on the books as an asset, again, possibly separate from the home. It's not part of the house, but it's a separate uh, asset related to the points that you would then allocate or amortize or get a deduction for similar to depreciation over say the life of the loan once you set that up in the first year if you're using the same tax software from year to year hopefully the depreciation and points calculations for the expense will be easy to calculate from that point forward obviously the first purchase you're gonna to have to comb through the closing statement and whatnot and make sure you got everything categorized correctly so the method used to figure the amount of points you can deduct each year, uh, allow, follows the original issue discount OID rules. In this case, points paid or treated as paid, such as seller paid points by a borrower to a lender, uh, uh, increase the OID, which is the excess of stated redemption price at maturity, generally the stated principal amount of the mortgage loan over the issue price, generally the amount borrowed reduced by the points. Note, for more detailed information on determining OID on a mortgage loan, including how to determine the stated redemption price at maturity and issue price of a mortgage loan, you can see the regulations under section 1274. So the first step to determine the amount of your deduction for the points is to determine whether your total OID on the mortgage loan, including the OID resulting from the points, is de minimis. So that usually means it's small enough so oftentimes in the tax code when you're forced to do these accrual type of things which are more complex then the question comes up is that more complex process worth our time because it might not be if the dollar amount is pretty small so you often have these de minimis uh, rules to say okay wait a sec this is a fairly small amount and therefore we're going to do kind of the easy thing so if the OID isn't de minimis, you must use the constant yield method to figure how much you can you can deduct. So if you put the points on the books, the general idea with the points oftentimes is if it's a prepayment of the loan, the question is, can I deduct it now or do I have to put it on the books and then amortize it over the life of the loan? If I have to amortize it over the life of the loan, the easiest thing to do would be to use a straight line method and simply amortize an equal amount, deduct an equal amount of the points over the life of the loan. But that's not exactly how interest works. Because if you look at, for example, an amortization schedule for a loan, the interest amount changes each period. So you would think that you'd have to have a more complex situation where it's not going to be the same amount that you deduct each period, unless, which is often the case for many loans, possibly you qualify for this de minimis calculation where you would think the easy thing to do, just amortizing straight line over the life of the loan would be acceptable. So de minimis OID. The OID is de minimis if it is less than one fourth of 1% of the stated redemption price at the maturity multiplied by the number, uh, number of full years from the date of original issue to the maturity term of the loan. So if the OID is de minimis, you can choose one of the following ways to figure the amount of points you can deduct each year. So on a constant yield basis over the term of the loan, on a straight line basis over the term of the loan in proportion to stated interest payments. So these are easier ways to do it. Again, the easiest way is probably like a straight line method, but in proportion to the stated interest payment, that might be fairly easy to do as well. Most tax software is going to, you can put it on the books kind of like an asset and amortize it. And so therefore the easiest thing to do is usually like a straight line kind of thing, because that's going to be easy for the tax software to calculate uh, in its entirety at maturity of the loan. 
So that would be fairly easy to do, but it's not usually what you'd want to do because you'd want to deduct the interest sooner rather than later if you were able to do that typically. So you make this choice by deducting the OID, including the points, in a manner consistent with the method chosen on your timely filed tax return for the tax year in which the loan is issued. So that means when you first deal with a new loan or refinancing or the purchase of the property, which results in a loan typically to help pay for the property, that's when this first confusing business all happens. And then once that's in the books, if you've got everything on the books properly, breaking out the cost of the property, breaking out the land versus the building, having the proper depreciation methods applied and entering the points properly, which has a proper amortization. If you use the same software from year to year, hopefully the depreciation expense will be easy to calculate going forward and all the data input that you have to do from that point on is the rest of the income statement relating to the maintenance of the rental property, rental income minus rental expenses because the depreciation and amortizations should be calculated by the software. Example, Carl took out a $100,000 mortgage loan on January 1st, 2023 to buy a house she will use as rental during 2023. The loan is to be repaid over 30 years. So the good old 30 year loan. The loan requires interest payments each year at a fixed rate. During 2023, Carl paid 10,000. Is that Carol? I said Carl. Carol paid 10,000. Sorry, Carol. Of mortgage interest stated interest to the lender. When the loan was made, she made a $1,500 uh, in points to the lender. So the amount of the OID on the loan is $1,500, which is the difference between the stated redemption price at maturity of $100,000 less the issue price, $98,500, the amount borrowed of $100,000 minus the points paid of $1,500. Carol determines that the points OID she paid are de minimis based on the following computation. So she said the stated redemption price at maturity, 100,000 multiplied by the term of the loan in complete years, 30, multiplied by that 0 0.0025 gives us a de minimis amount, 7,500. Therefore, the amount we're talking about is under that. Therefore, it's de minimis. Therefore, we should be able to do the easy thing, which is oftentimes the straight line amortization over the life of the loan. So the points OID, she paid 1,500 are less than the de minimis amount, 7,500. So we could do the easy thing. Therefore, Carol has a de minimis OID and she can choose one of the four ways discussed earlier to figure the amount she can deduct each year. Under the straight line method, that's the one most people pick because it's the easy one, she can deduct $50 each year for 30 years. So she's deducting it not over the same kind of calculation as the life of the property, which will be determined by the depreciation basis, but simply on the life of the loan, which oftentimes is 15 or 30 years. In this case, we got the standard 30 year. So we got the constant yield method. If the OID, including the points, isn't de minimis, you must use the constant yield method. Oh no, please be de minimis to figure how much you can deduct each year. You figure your deduction for the first year in the following manner. Determine the issue price of the loan. If, the, if you paid points on the loan, the issue price is generally the difference between the amount borrowed and the points. Multiply the result in one by the yield to maturity defined later. Subtract any qualified stated interest payments defined later from the result in two. This is the OID you can deduct in the first year. Yield to maturity, the YTM in other words. This is the rate. Uh, this rate is generally shown in the literature you receive from your lender. So they're usually going to have that a yield to maturity. So if you don't have this information, consult your lender or tax advisor. In general, the yield to maturity is the discount rate that when used in computing the present value of all principal and interest payments produces an amount equal to the issue price of the loan. So that's often useful to, for, to make comparisons between different loans. So qualified stated interest, the QSI in general, this is the stated interest that is unconditionally paid in cash or property other than another debt instrument of the borrower at least annually over the term of the loan at a fixed rate. Example, year one. 
So the facts are the same as the previous example. The YTM of Carol's loan is 10.2467% compounded annually. She figures the amount of points OID she could deduct in 2023 as follows. So you've got the amount borrowed, 100000 minus the de minimis, 1500 issue price of the loan, 98500 So now we're going to multiply by the uh, yield to maturity, 0.102467. The total is 10093 minus the the QSI, 10,000, so the points OIE deductible in 2023, 93. So to figure your deduction in any subsequent year, you start with the adjusted issue price. To get the adjusted issue price, add the issue price figured in one, any OID previously deducted, then follow step two and three earlier. So year two, Carol figure the deduction for 2024 as followed, issue price. 98,500 plus points OIED deducted in 2023, $93. Adjusted issue price, 98,593 multiplied by the YTM, 0.102467. The total, 10,103 minus the QSI, 10,103. So you can see the amount of deduction is basically changing. Uh, it's different from year to year. It's, it's kind of similar to, to the concept of the amortization on an amortization schedule where the interest changes, although the payment is the same. So, so it's kind of a pain, of course, if you had to do this calculation. Hopefully, it's de minimis, small, so you can use the straight line method. Loan or mortgage ends. All right, so if your loan or mortgage ends, you may be able to deduct the remaining uh, points, OID, and the tax year in which the loan or mortgage ends. So why would the loan or mortgage end? Note that if, let's imagine you're paying points, you have put them on the book properly. Let's say they were de minimis and you're just amortizing them over 30 years, just expensing the same amount using a straight line method over 30 years. Well, if the loan went for 30 years, then it would be totally amortized by the end of the loan. But oftentimes the loan doesn't go 30 years because either one, the loan was refinanced. So basically you have a new loan that kind of took over the old loan, which means now you've got these points hanging out there. And the question is, what do you do with the points in that case? Or you sold the property, in which case you're not refinancing the loan, you're selling it to someone off and paying off the loan. You pay off the loan early. And now again, you've got these points that are hanging on. What do you do with the points? So you might be able to deduct them. Uh, in that case. So the loan or mortgage may end due to refinancing, prepayment, foreclosure, or similar event. However, if the refinancing is with the same lender, the remaining points OID generally aren't deductible in the year in which the refinancing occurs. So you would think that you might be able to deduct them if the loan ends. Now, obviously, if you sold the property and then you paid off the loan, you would think that you would be able to deduct the points at that point in time. It doesn't make any sense to continue amortizing the points over 30 years when you no longer have the loan on the books anymore. But if you refinance the loan with the same lender, then you can see how people might try to manipulate things, right? If the points were, were significant, and you simply refinance the loan so that now you can deduct the points that have now rolled into the new loan, then that can be somewhat manipulative. So if you're just refinancing, you're taking out another loan, possibly because the interest rates are lower, you might have to continue with the points <laughs> that, are, that, are, that were there from the prior one. So in which refinance, but you may, may be deductible over the term of the new mortgage. So in other words, whatever the life of the new mortgage is, possibly you can amortize them evenly over the life of the new loan for the remaining points that have not yet been amortized from the old loan. Points when loan refinance is more than the previous outstanding balance. When you refinance a rental property for more than the previous outstanding balance, the portion of the points allocable to the loan proceeds not related to rental use generally can't be deducted as rental expense. Example, you refinanced a loan with a balance of 100,000. The amount of the new loan is 120,000. So you, you had a loan, 
Now maybe the property value went up in the, in the home. And so you want to take some of that equity quote out, out. And so now you refinance, not just to get a better rate, but to get more, to get money. So you refinance at 120, you're pulling out 20,000 and buying a car or something. No, <laughs> doing whatever you can do. So you use the additional 20,000 to, per you did buy a car to purchase the car. I guessed it. So the points allocate allocable to the 20,000 would be treated as a non-deductible personal interest. So this becomes an issue now because notice that when you're when you're looking at the financing of the home then you would think that you would be able to deduct the interest not simply because the loan is collateral but because you needed the money in order to purchase the home in other words we we typically get to deduct the interest related to the purchase of the property because we had to get that purchasing power in order to purchase the property. Therefore, the interest is like rent on the money and is an ordinary and necessary business expense. However, if we're lose if we're using our rental property to to as collateral to get money from the bank, we got twenty thousand dollars here extra, but we didn't use that to to pay for something in the rental property, we bought a personal car with it, then then we don't get to deduct the interest related to that part of the loan, even though the rental property is collateral, because the the rent is paying for the car, which is being used for personal use. So in other words, whether or not you can deduct you would think would be dependent upon how you used the money. Was it used for the business or not? Not what the collateral is, because the collateral is the rental property. The question though is how you use the money. Okay, so repairs and improvements. Generally an expense for repairing or maintaining your rental property may be deducted if you aren't required to capitalize. So whenever you repair something, the question is, is it a repair or is it an improvement? If you just, the classic example, if you fixed a hole in the roof, you repaired the roof, usually deductible, even though that might be quite expensive. If you replaced the entire roof, then you would think you have improved the roof, you've extended the life, and therefore you might have to put that on the books as an asset, as opposed to expensing it. Improvements. You must capitalize any expense you have paid to improve your rental property. An expense is for an improvement if it results in betterment to your property, restores your property, or adopts your property to a new or different use. Table 1-1 shows examples of many improvements. Now note, if you look at your property and you see in repairs and maintenance or something like that, a very large dollar amount, if it's got hundreds of thousands of dollars in repairs and maintenance, then that might be an indication that those repairs and maintenance are quite large and might quite possibly be improvements. So you want to make sure to check that out because again, the IRS, of course, might look at that line item and say, hey, that's a lot. If I compare this to other related rental properties for a similar dollar amount, I'm seeing way more repairs and maintenance in this one than the others. Possibly I'm going to ask them questions about it because it looks like they might have improvements that they just expensed in repairs and maintenance. So from a bookkeeping perspective, any amount over a certain dollar amount, we might want to put a double check on and ask ourselves, is this something that should be an improvement or something that we can expense, possibly contacting the, the CPA or the tax preparer for those larger purchases. Betterments, expenses that may result in a better Meant uh, to your property include expenses for fixing a pre-existing defect or condition, enlarging or expanding your property, or increasing the capacity, strength, or quality of your property. I'd like to increase the strength so the roof doesn't fall in my head anymore. Restorations. So expenses that may be for re restoration include expenses for replacing a substantial structure part of your property, repairing damage to your property after your property adjusted the basis of your property as a result of casualty loss or rebuilding your property to a like, uh, a like new condition. Adoption. Expenses that may be for adoption include expenses for altering your property to a use that isn't consistent with the intended ordinary use of your property when uh, you began renting the property. So if you convert the property into a fire station or something with the fire you know, pole in it or something like that it has a different 
used than it did before, then that might uh, mean that you have to uh, put it in as an improvement. De minimis safe harbor for tangible property. Here we go with that de minimis thing again. When we hear the de minimis safe harbors, we're thinking, can't we just do the easy thing? Because it's not a lot of money. So I'd like to do the easy thing. So if you elect the de minimis safe harbor for your rental activity for the tax year, you aren't required to capitalize the de minimis costs of acquiring or producing certain real and tangible personal property and may deduct these amounts as rental expenses on line 19 of Schedule E. So it's just like, come on. It's a de minimis amount. I don't want to have to capitalize it. That's a pain. Let me just expense it. I don't want it on the depreciation schedule and then have to deal with it from year to year. Give me a break, man. Let me do the easy thing. For more information on electing and using the de minimis safe harbor for tangible property, see tangible property regulations, frequently asked questions. Safe harbor for routine maintenance. So here's another safe harbor thing for the maintenance. You're like, dude, do I have to put this on the books as an asset? It's part of routine maintenance. So I should be able to just expense it. If you determine that your cost was for an improvement to a building or equipment, you may still be able to deduct your cost under the routine maintenance safe harbor. So you can see tangible property uh, regulations frequently asked questions for more information there. So the expenses you capitalize for improving your property can generally be depreciated as if the improvement were separate property. So in other words, if you say it's an improvement, then you can't expense it, have to put it on the books as an asset. Typically, it's not going to be increasing the basis of the original property. You can have another line item on your depreciation schedule for the improvements and another depreciation allocation. And then you'll just depreciate it uh, over the useful life according to the depreciation terms that are related to the improvement, which we might touch on in future presentations.